growing up uh, in County Limerick, uh, we heard from our teachers that the Irish fought in every war but our own. And indeed, there was a long history of the Irish fighting and dying, either for or against England and the continental wars that raged in Europe for hundreds of years. But this particular song, the Bantry Girls Lament that I'm going to sing for you today, is not about the Irish fighting against or for the British for a change. I'd like to proceed the song with a recitation, a very little known recitation these days, though it was fairly popular when it was written back in 1897. It was authored by Joseph Ignatius Constantine Clark. Quite a mouthful, that. He was born in 1846 in Dunleary and moved with his family over to London where he worked as a British civil servant until for patriotic reasons he left the job in 1868 and moved first to Paris but then uh, to New York and lived there mostly uh, for the rest of his life until he died in 1927 at the age of 80. He was a very colourful character, a very prolific character and uh, he became a newspaper editor for the short-lived publication in New York, the Irish Times. Uh, and then afterwards worked in the New York Herald and was associated with a famous prank. He would have ended up in prison today for that, I'm sure, where they ran a hoax story about animals escaping the Central Park Zoo and running amok in Manhattan. People locked their doors and went out in the street with guns. It was quite the story of its time, but he got over that one anyway. Became a fervent Irish nationalist, uh, became a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, and published books like uh, a biography of Robert Emmett. Later in his life, he was to become uh, an expert on Japan as an imperial power, very fond of Japanese culture, uh, and uh, wrote quite a bit about that. He was very, very, very eclectic in his taste. But he wrote this particular res uh, recitation, um, and a recitation is a poem uh, written in such a way that it could be recited and delivered on the stage. It is sort of the language that lends itself to that. A lot of lyrical poetry does not, of course. But he wrote this called The Fighting Race uh, in 1897, immediately after the sinking of the battleship The Main in Havana Harbour. Uh, and that was blamed on, on the Spanish, uh, officially by the Americans, and gave rise to the Spanish-American War where uh, Spain lost its empire, lost Puerto Rico and the Philippines, and that was the end of the Spanish Empire. But the recitation is very striking, and it's on the theme of the Irish fighting and dying in foreign wars. And it's called The Fighting Race. Read out the names, and Burke sat back, and Kelly drooped his head, and Shea, they called him Scholar Jack, read out the list of the dead. Officers, gunners, soldiers, marines, the crews of the gig and the yawl, the bearded man and the lad in his teens, coal passers, carpenters all. Then knocking the ashes from out of his pipe, said Burke, in an offhand way, we're all on that dead man's list by cripes. Kelly, Burke and Shea, and here's to the main and sorry for Spain said Kelly, Burke, and Shea. Wherever there's Kellys, there's trouble, said Burke. Wherever fightens the game or a whiff of danger in grown man's work, said Kelly, you'll find our name. And what about us, said Burke, getting mad when it's touch and go for life, said Shea. It's thirty odd years, be dad, since I marched to drum and fife. Up Marius hills on my old canteen stopped a rebel ball in the way. There were blossoms of blood on our sprigs of green. Kelly, Burke and Shea. And the dead didn't brag. Well, here's to the flag, said Kelly, Burke and Shea. I wish it was in Ireland for there's the place, said Burke, that we die by right in the cradle of our soldier race after one big stand-up fight. My grandfather fell on Vinegar Hill, though fighting was not his trade, and his rusty pikes in the cabin still, with Hessian blood on the blade. Aye, aye, says Kelly, the pikes were great when the word was clear the way. We were thick on the rolls in 98. Kelly, 
Burke and Shea, and here's to the pike and the sword and the like, said Kelly, Burke and Shea. And Shea the scholar with rising joy said we were at Ramillies and left our bones at Fontenoy, high up in the Pyrenees, before Dunkirk and Landon's Plain, Cremona, Lille and Ghent, all over Austria, France and Spain, wherever they'd pitched a tent. We died for England from Waterloo to Egypt and Dargay, but there's still enough for a corps or a crew, Kelly, Burke, and Shea. And here's to good, honest fighting blood, said Kelly, Burke, and Shea. Oh, the fighting races don't die out if they seldom die in bed, for love is first in their hearts, no doubt, said Burke. Then Kelly said, when Michael the Irish Archangel stands, the angel with the sword, and the battle dead from a hundred lands are gathered in one big horde. Our line that for Gabriel's trumpet waits will stretch ten deep that day from Jehoshaphat to the Golden Gate, Kelly, Burke and Shea. And here's thank God for the race and the sod, Kelly, Burke and Shea. I first heard the Bantry Girls' Lament, sung by the late Tim Lyons. He was from County Cork, but he lived a lot of his life in Newmarket and Fergus in County Clare. And I met him frequently in my visits home from America. We'd play sessions together. He was a great melodeon player uh, and also have singing uh, sessions together. And he was a, a mighty singer. And I first heard him singing this song in La Hinch. But I'd heard a recording of it before, uh, the Bantry Girls' Lament, recorded by Delia Murphy, a great singer who flourished in the 1940s and 50s. And along with Margaret Barry, there were very unique voices in Irish song at that time, two very strong women uh, in a man's world, uh, performing in public and, and making recordings at a time when it was not fashionable to do that at all. Now, the Bantry in the song is not the Bantry of County Cork, which is a beautiful town, of course, uh, uh, on, on, on Bantry Bay, with the sheep's head and the mizzen and the Beira Peninsulas close by, some of the picturesque, most picturesque scenery in Ireland in County Cork. But the Bantry in question is actually in County Wexford, and it's on the flank of the Blackstairs uh, Mountains, uh, the Bantry Barony. Uh, and I'm indebted to the great cultural geographer from County Kilkenny, Jack Burchell, for alerting me to the fact that um, the money whore mentioned in the song, uh, it was actually a townland in County Kilkenny, very associated with faction fights, hiring fairs uh, took place there annually. And uh, all scores were settled a lot at faction fights that were very serious affairs. And the weapon of choice was the shillelagh, the blackthorn stick, you might say. Now, in America, as we know, the shillelagh is a fairly harmless symbol of Irish Americana associated with the leprechaun. But in these faction fights, it was certainly nothing of the sort. It was a deadly weapon. And if you got a wallop from a shillelagh, that would ruin your day or maybe ruin a lot longer than your day. I suppose, in a sense, faction fights... Uh, were the precursor of, of games, uh, hurling, I suppose, would be one of those games, uh, and they're fairly animated affairs, not as animated as faction fights, of course. Now, uh, what was a, a person from the, the Bantry Barney doing fighting in Spain? Well, he and others were most probably fighting on behalf of Queen Isabella II, who came to the throne on the death of her father, King Ferdinand VII. And he died just before her third birthday, but her succession was challenged by her uncle, the Infante Carlos, who was a staunchly Catholic reactionary, and his refusal to accept a female sovereign led to the first of the bloody Carlist wars. And just like in the Spanish Civil War of a much later date, uh, people from other countries uh, enlisted uh, in that fight, in that particular fight, uh, and uh, regiments were formed, uh, in Ireland, Scotland uh, and England and uh, they came together, 10,000 strong, uh, to fight in the first Carlist War. And the song probably dates from that, the Bantry uh, man in question, whose, whose absence was lamented because our brave captain, the captain of the faction fighters, was nowhere to be seen. 
Um, the song first appears around the 1880s in, in local song collections, but it's, it's quite common that a song would be written, especially in that part of Ireland, many years after the event itself. For instance, uh, songs of the 1798 rebellion, many of them were written, which took place not far from there. Many of them uh, would, uh, would have been written maybe 40, even 50 years afterwards, uh, celebrating the heroic deeds of the past. So that's when the, first, uh, the song first appears in the 1880s and uh, probably about uh, events of the 1830s. Now, this is probably far more information than most of you want to need, but I'm fascinated in the stories behind these songs. They represent kind of a collective memory there, in many ways, uh, our local and our nati national history. Anyway, I'm delighted to sing the Bantry Girls Lament with two of my very favorite musicians, uh, Brenda Castles from County Mead singing harmony and playing the concertina, and the redoubtable Athena Turgus, the Bantry Girls Lament. Oh, who will plow the fields now, and who will sell the corn, and who will watch the sheep now, and keep them neatly shorn, and the stack that's in the hanger, We'll be 